WNYC is supported by Poly Prep Country Day School, focusing on mind, body, and character since 1854, offering classes from nursery through 12th grade on two Brooklyn campuses and enrolling students from New York City and beyond. Open houses start in September. More at polyprep.org. You know the day destroys the night. Night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side, yeah. After Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, died in 1971, the band struggled to continue without him and and then dissolved after a couple of years. The three remaining band members performed under different names, but The Doors' name remained sacred until ten years ago when two of the survivors, guitarist Robbie Krieger and keyboardist Ray Manzarek, decided to tour as The Doors, and their drummer, John Densmore, took them to court to prevent them from using the name. Now, Mr. Densmore has written a memoir called The Doors Unhinged. Jim Morrison's legacy goes on trial. It chronicles that court battle and his ongoing quest to protect the band's legacy in an age of commercialism. The book is published by Create Space and Kindle Direct Publishing, and I'm very pleased to welcome John Densmore to our show today. Hello. Good morning, Leonard. First, um, can you give us a short history of The Doors? How did the four of you meet and uh, come to form a band? Oh. Um, well, uh, the guitar player, Robbie, and I were friends, and we were fooling around with then-legal legal psychedelics, and and then we realized that's a little heavy on the nervous system, so let's go check out this Maharishi, Maharishi meditation class. And that's where I met Ray. And um, he knew Jim. Jim, uh, Jim didn't actually meditate, but he did come to see Maharishi one time because he wanted to look in his eyes and see if he had any knowledge. And he said, he does, but I'm not meditating. So he <laughs> he felt he could look in your eyes and, and see whether you knew something? <laughs> well, they are the wind- windows of the soul, aren't they, Leonard? Uh, it said the band got together, and uh, bands uh, have to make decisions. Uh, we've seen many conflicts over the years. How did you make decisions about the band and your music? Well, <clears throat> since Jim could not play one chord on any instrument, he said, uh, how do we write songs? How, I don't know anything about this, and I've never sang. And therefore, let's just share everything, all the money, all the writing credits, l- let's say written by the doors instead of me as the lyricist. So, and, and let's have veto power in case anyone gets weird. So there's no majority rule. It was one person objected and... That was enough to stop something. Thank God. But, and as far that, that has to be unusual for a rock band. Well, I think that arrangement is uh, unusual for any his, in the history of pop music. Uh, usually, the the songwriters garner most of the dough. And even then, we have some. We saw battles between uh, the, the various writers for the Beatles over the years, where it was Lennon and McCartney. But mm. then uh, somebody said, "Well, this is really Lennon. This is really a McCartney." Um, did you sign a, a written contract to that effect? Uh, we did uh, eventually when we got more organized, and, and it's uh, in ink, fortunately. Now, the you said that you, every you just gave writing credit to the Doors, but everyone assumed that Jim wrote the lyrics while you, Ray, and Robbie collaborated on the music. Is that how it worked? Primarily, uh, Robbie did come in with uh, some songs, "Light My Fire" for one, what a biggie. And he wrote right, "Light My Fire." Right, Jim wrote. There was one line missing, and Jim thought of. Our love become a funeral fire. Yeah, that's why I thought he wrote the lyric, because that's a Jim Morrison line. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I'm jumping here, but uh, so when we first got offered Come On Buick Light My Fire, he went ballistic. Now, think about that, Leonard. It's not his lyric. So he's what, he's concerned about the catalog, the whole image of the whole thing. And that's, so way back when, people were already approaching you about using your songs. For yeah. commercials. Well, I mean, this was after, uh, you know... Uh, you we, might have saved Buick. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. We could help GM and, be, yeah. Uh, you know, Light My Fire uh, 
was uh, on our first album, and it's been downhill ever since. How long was it before you realized that Jim had serious addiction problems? Um, about mid-career. Was he uh, able to mask them? Because they they dogged him for most of his adult life, didn't they? They did. And they killed him. Uh, uh, somehow, I mean, L.A. Woman was our last record, and it, it's a, excuse me, it's a jewel. And I, I'm really proud of it. I love it. And uh, he was, by then, an alcoholic with a disease. Um, but damn, when we were alone, the muse blessed us, and, and I'm forever thankful. What happened to the Doors after he died? It was 1971. You were at, you were superstars yeah. at the point. Uh, Ray and I and Robbie uh, got a very lucrative deal for five more albums, and we had the sensibility not to replace Jim, and they tried to sing. And uh, we persevered. We didn't want to give up this musical synchronicity we developed. In so you stayed as a trio. But after two albums, we passed on the rest of the big front money for the last three because we what are we what are we doing here without the man? So then you decided to start bands on your own. Correct. Uh, when did uh, Ray and Robbie decide to tour the the Doors again? Um, let's see, <clears throat> two thousand three. Approximately, and uh, I guess uh, they weren't doing much otherwise, and they thought this would be a good idea. Well, <clears throat> they were offered a huge amount of dough to play one gig, and I was having problems with my ears, and I said go. And but uh, they, they, did they ask you to be the drummer? Well, yeah, they wanted me to, mm -hmm. and um, I said no, nah, I can't do it, and so. Uh, they made so much dough and did so well, they all of a sudden announced a tour, didn't tell me, and uh, they were off and running. Found another drummer. Did they find uh, another lead singer? <clears throat> yeah, um, Ian Asbury from The Cult. And the drummer was Stuart Copeland, a wonderful drummer from, from the, police. the Police. So th that, that was a nice band, actually. Yeah, well, yeah. And were they playing old, The Doors' old hits, or were they well, doing new material? They kept talking about new material. Maybe they played one or two here and there, but primarily they played the old stuff. And, you know, uh, gee, um, Mr. Asbury wore leather pants a lot and kind of <laughs> moved around like somebody I know. And uh, um, the interesting thing is that Stuart, in the beginning, said to them, uh, hey, who owns the name? What's the deal here? I, I, I'm sitting on John's drum stool. I respect him a lot. Uh, what, can we do this? And they really didn't get an answer. And then you asked them to change the name of the band, so they chose the Doors of the 21st Century. <laughs> yes. Well, you're smiling. Well, that's a an odd name. But uh, why wasn't that sufficiently different for you? Uh, well, when you... In the ads, when you put the 21st century in a minuscule font <laughs> and the door is huge, um, hmm, manipulation. Mm -hmm. So they were really just promoting themselves as the doors. Um, and it's like those ads that say, free, and then in tiny type say, <laughs> if you spend $10,000 on something else in our store. That's funny. Yeah. So, so uh, they... Uh, so what happened then? You you went to them um, and I, said, you I, know, gee, this is really just a manipulation? I called Robbie over and over saying, what are you doing? Please make it clear. Please, please. Okay, I will. And he didn't get to it. My guess is John Densmore. He's written a book called The Doors Unhinged. Jim Morrison's legacy goes on trial. Well, there are cover bands who are playing The Doors music. Why did you decide that you needed to sue these guys from uh, using the name? Well, um, <clears throat> the cover bands that are playing, um, well, they they make about $1,000 a night and have a few hundred fans. Uh, Ray and Robbie go out with The Doors name, go to South America where they don't understand uh, the language, but who cares? Somebody's wearing leather pants. They, they garner... Um, Hundreds of thousands a night. But couldn't you have joined them? And wasn't the money good for you too? Um, 
I just felt, bottom line, the doors without Jim Morrison. Is that work? The Stones without Mick, the Police without Sting. Well, but I, the I, but the Stones did go on after they lost another Mick. Well, yeah, but he was. The, oh, Brian Jones. He, I mean. They were guitar players. Uh, guitar players and drummers are disposable, I guess, Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and drummers uh, like Keith Moon after the yeah. from, from uh, the Who. Um, so, if, if it had been you, who? Well, we we're not going to go into that. So thank um, you. <laughs> uh, is there any consensus uh, in, uh, on this kind of issue in the music world? When Jerry Garcia died, the remaining members of the Grateful Dead toured as the other ones, but then as the Dead, and that's what everybody had called the Grateful Dead anyway. Right, without the Grateful part. Well, um, uh, D O O R S is it for me? So if they'd call themselves the oars, it would have been okay for you? <laughs> no, uh, I was thinking it takes four doors to make a sedan so they could be the coops. Uh-huh. Uh, did, they, uh, did they feel it wasn't uh, this, well, in, in the, you, you talked to them about all of this, and what were they saying to you? You're just being difficult? Uh, Robbie was saying, uh, well, I'll try and change it. You're right. Mm -hmm. So they were saying you were right, but then they were ignoring it. Yeah. The uh, subtitle of your book is Jim Morrison's Legacy Goes on Trial. For you, was that the major issue uh, when you wound up going to trial on all of this? Yeah. Um, Jim was so adamant about not selling our songs for commercials. And uh, we were four brothers bound together. And uh, I think the doors, I'm pleased to say they're back on their hinges. And they are Jim, Ray, Robbie, John, not Robbie, Jim, Stuart, Tom, Fred, and Herman. Now, um you mentioned that uh, when Jim was still alive, you were offered a lot of money uh, to uh, to use a light my use light my fire in a Buick commercial. Were you Ray and Robbie in favor of doing it? Oh, you're pressing me. I admit it. Yeah, we were. I would say today that money was a few million dollars, and we were young, and we we're like, oh my god. And Jim came back in town and said, "Good idea." And I will smash the car on TV with a sledgehammer. Oh, that's a no. Well, General Motors obviously likes Dora's songs. Uh, we'll take a little <laughs> break, and we'll come back and talk about the Cadillac commercial. Terrific. Um, my guest is John Densmore, the former drummer with The Doors. Uh, he's written a book called The Doors, Jim Morrison's Legacy Goes on Trial. The Doors Unhinged, Jim Morrison's Legacy Goes on Trial. It is published by a company with a very long name. Me, Percussive Press. Ah, Percussive Press. Yeah. As a as a drummer, I guess it makes sense that you would name your yeah. your publishing company that. Stay with us for more. Love my girl. She looks good. Come on. One more. Five to one, baby. One in five. No one here gets out alive now. You get yours, baby. I'll get mine. Don't We're back with John Densmore, the man playing the drums on that record. He's written a couple of books. The most recent is The Doors Unhinged, Jim Morrison's Legacy Goes on Trial. Uh, it didn't bother anybody when other people uh, recorded Light My Fire, for example. Uh, that was that was different? Um, our policy is that anyone can cover our songs. And it's odd when I step into an elevator and hear a real saccharine version of something. But Jose Feliciano, you probably like well, that. I loved it because you, he, he made it a ballad. He, he interpreted it so different that it was thrilling for us. Bottom line, uh, we're not going to let it sell products. 
Now, part of the the case of when you went to court involves uh, another commercial that was proposed. Early on, uh, well, you, you'd had that Buick offer, and then more recently, didn't you get another offer, this time also from GM, for a Cadillac commercial? What was their offer? Well, <clears throat> it started out uh, pretty big, like about $5 million, and then I used my veto, and they double, and then they triple Leonard, and my knees are shaking. So it's $15 million to run a song, to use a song in a commercial for Cadillac. Correct. And you said no. Correct. So is that part of what precipitated this lawsuit? I was um, countersued uh, for not fulfilling my fiduciary duty as a businessman and making the most dough as possible. But you had uh, – could you cite the original agreement in which everybody had veto power? Well, you'd think that somebody would have said uh, – <clears throat> What what this is pretty clear cut here, but they didn't, and so then the lawyers character assassinate. That's all they got. But uh, again, we run into a situation where even groups like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles have allowed their songs to be used in commercials. Well, Leonard, the Beatles um, up to the White Album, they had sold their publishing, and uh, so they didn't have the power to say <laughs> yay or nay and. And I know for a fact that uh, they were not pleased with the way some of their early songs were used. The Stones are another thing. And then there's uh, Janis Joplin, uh, Oh Lord, Won't You Buy Me a Mercedes-Benz, being used not by Cadillac or Buick, but by Mercedes-Benz. And then there's Bob Dylan. Mm. Yeah, Bob Dylan. <laughs> oh, my is. God. So, so it, it, I, in, in it, it our, isn't like you're holding the line. No, it's not. Um and a new band trying to pay the rent, you know, do it if you have to. But um, then uh, I, I align with Tom Waits when he wrote a letter in response to an article I wrote about this subject. He said, you ought to take a close look at whether you want to change your lyrics into a jingle. But then, uh, well, there, there was uh, a, a Pirelli Tar commercial that ran in the U.K. that used the Doors song. Damn it, Leonard, you're... On me, yeah. And then uh, oh. Oliver Stone, of course, used well, all the songs. Oh, no, no, no. You're Francis Ford Coppola in Apocalypse Stop. Now. Stop. Forrest Gump. <laughs> all right, let me. This is not sacrosanct. Can I talk to you? <laughs> um, the, you, you know, you may think I was hired by the other side. <laughs> just try to do my job as a talk show host. Oh, that's good. Um, no, we're thrilled when uh, someone like Francis. Um, puts uh, the end in Apocalypse Now. And there's a wonderful journalist uh, who testified for me, Anthony DeCurtis, said, you think Francis would have done that if the Doors had okayed the song for an Oscar Mayer Wiener commercial before that? So how did you find a, a lawyer to represent you? What did you, uh, and what did he tell you to expect? Um, are, are there legal precedents in a case like this? Uh... I didn't think it would go so long and be so expensive, I'll tell you. As I joked with him, I, I didn't know your hand was going to be in my pocket this long. But but it, it, he persevered. I mean, David took out Goliath. That's so. Were you uh, Did you have the support of Jim Morrison's heirs? That was a beautiful thing. Um, they, I lobbied. I, I started this mess, and after a few months of lobbying, they came on board. And here's what's so beautiful. Jim's dad, uh, 86-year-old admiral who was in Vietnam fighting the war. We write The Unknown Soldier against the war. Jim says his parents are dead in his original bio. He comes around to stand up for his son's legacy. Uh, in fact, Jim had kind of uh, written off his whole family. He he uh, left everything to his girlfriend, didn't he? Well, oh, yes, but what happened? But then she died. She passed. All right, so, and then her heirs split half of it with Jim's heirs. So that's sweet. Now, interestingly, the guy who replaced you, uh, Stuart Copeland, testified for you. Yeah. Fabulous. <clears throat> well, he, he had written a memo because he wasn't getting answers to these questions. Uh, uh, who owns the name? What about John? And that memo, <laughs> what, what an exhibit. Oh, my God. And then he comes in and reads it. The, he reads the memo, which yeah. was? 
which was, oh. uh, uh, please answer these questions. You go into great detail about testimony in the case. What was it like testifying against your former bandmates who had been your friends? Very painful. And and then hearing what they had to say about you? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, the, in the last chapter of this book, I say they're my musical brothers, and, and I sent the chapter to them to try and start some healing. Uh, you know, how could they not be with what we created? But sitting there, um, well, in the beginning when I did the suit, I thought, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm sabotaging my family. What am I doing? It's ridiculous. But then I think of Jim, and I think of, um, you know, break on through to a new deodorant. Uh-uh. And then you, their lawyer try to portray you as a communist, an anarchist, even a supporter of al-Qaeda. How did he come to that? <laughs> Character assassination. Oh, I had uh, donated some money to a nonviolent group of protesters that were up at the WTO thing in the Northwest. And there was some fringe people called the anarchists who broke windows and stuff. And they said I funded them, you know. And uh, when the towers came down, I was talking to the guitar player for about an hour about this horrible event. And I somewhere in there said, you know, we're a rich country. We should really look at this. And so you excerpt little things and, and without the context. Whew. So how did the case turn out? The doors are back on their hinges. I, I assume that Ray and Robbie appealed to the decision. They appealed... Then they took it to the Supreme Court. Of just, the United States? Uh, no, California. Oh. And it dragged on forever. Because I wonder how Samuel Alito would uh, <laughs> decide on this. <laughs> Big rock fan. Um, <laughs> how long before it was finally over? Oh, uh, five years, give or take. And uh, do you think that this case will be cited in the future when other bands face similar problems? Well, I don't know, but I mean, I hope that this book uh, is a message about, uh, uh, what was that, uh, Timothy Leary? I mean, he, he took too many drugs, but he said one good one. Um, uh, the one thing the rich have, have over the poor, they know that money is not it. Yeah, or not everything. Is it, Robbie has a jazz band now, doesn't he? No, I'm the guy with the jazz band. Oh. Yeah. So you're playing, uh, you, well, you're going back to your roots, you probably started yeah. off... Uh, wanting to be a jazz drummer and then found yourself in rock and all you do is you turn your sticks around the other way and oh my god next thing you know you're a rock drummer <laughs> no 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 oh jazz drumming is the ultimate elvin jones was my idol i write a little about that yeah uh the jazz group's on the shelf right now i've got this book to get going and this is your second book the first was writers in the storm uh <laughs> an autobiography leonard i felt i needed two self-centered memoirs and 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 they're in the first person. I did this, I did that, and one of my idols, Salman Rushdie, finally put his out, and it's, he said it was too arrogant, and he's, he did this, he did that. Yeah, Joseph but, Anton. Joseph Anton. And see, but I'm not a genius like that guy, so. You've also been producing films in recent years? Um, back a few years, I produced several documentaries on the uh, prison industrial complex mess. So th there's always been a political focus. I, yeah, uh, I believe uh, you get the brass ring. It's natural to give back and try and help improve. It, you level the playing field a little more. It'll never be level, but you got to try. So you have two books, and you've also been writing for Rolling Stone, The Guardian, The Nation, other periodicals. Today, do you think of yourself mostly as a writer? Right now. And it's funny, after the first book, which was a New York Times bestseller, I couldn't say I was a writer. I, I, just, I knew I was a musician, but I, and I knew I had a voice, but I was insecure. But after these little articles, I, now, I, now I feel I definitely have another avenue of creativity. Well, we have this book, which uh, is uh, dedicated to Danny Sugarman. Who's Danny Sugarman? Danny Sugarman was our old manager who... Um, Smoked a lot of cigarettes like dear George Harrison and uh, checked out early. My great thanks to John Densmore, the uh, drummer with The Doors, when they were actually The Doors. He has written a memoir called The Doors Unhinged. Jim Morrison's legacy goes on trial. It is published by Create Space and Kindle Direct Publishing. And 
Uh, it has been my great pleasure to talk with you today. Lots of fun. This is the end, beautiful friend. This is the end, my own.